uh, my opinions have been very clear about the recent uh, uh, report that they took out. I think it's a, uh, for the lack of better words, uh, that report is rubbish. You know, it is propaganda peddled in the name of journalism. Um, I've gone through that report very closely. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Infal Times interview. Today we have Rami Niranjan Desai. Rami Niranjan Desai is an anthropologist, an author. She is expertise in the study of etric studies and travel studies. She was the former founder of Norris Policy Institute. Four months have passed since the conflict in Manipur has started between two communities. Civil life has paralyzed. All the functions of the state have been halted. Today, we will be discussing with Ms. Desai in detail of the cause and is there any solution to this conflict. So Ms. Desai, welcome to Infal Times interview. Good morning and thank you very much for having me on. So uh, to start with, uh, we would like to discuss on uh, the genesis of uh, the present turmoil. So how do you perceive this present civil unrest in Manipur? Well, first of all, I have to say that, you know, it's very unfortunate that, you know, the unrest began and has been going on for so long. But I think I would assess it as rooted in legacy issues and not a singular trigger sort of conflict. You know, I think it is a multi-layered conflict and uh, it has its genesis in the kind of maybe the land laws that you have and the impact that it has generally then on the larger society. Uh, also, of course, there are many other modern day issues like uh, illegal infiltration, uh, the anxieties around demographic change, so on and so forth. So do you uh, agree uh, with the fact that this is a, a post-independent issue or do you have any uh, linkage with any historical uh, events to this uh, conflict? So I've never seen any of the conflicts in the Northeast as just post-independence issues. I think a lot of the segregation, a lot of the uh, divisions that we see in the Northeast today are colonial divisions. Those are policies of administration that were brought in at the time uh, when with the British advent into the region. And I think that really is the genesis, whether uh, it is segregating populations, whether it's dividing uh, uh, geographical locations on merely the basis of hills and the plains. I think that really is what caused this sort of uh, bifurcations that we see in society today, divisions that we see in society today. And I don't think that is that is really just, uh, it has had political repercussions, but I think it has had uh, more sociological repercussions as well. And I think the worst of all that it's had psychological repercussions you know today when we see the northeast and for a long time we've had uh, these issues with the northeast in terms of that it has seemed geographically and psychologically distant uh, to the rest of the country i owe all of that to the colonial legacy in the region okay so you mean to say that uh, because of the british raj and the way uh, how they bring a group of a particular community to this state and how they make them settle uh, taking into consideration uh, the Maharaj def uh, defensive uh, role and the position where many other uh, communities uh, have rebelled <coughs> from the hills and the kings have to be protected uh, with the help of a different community who, who, who were brought from uh, Myanmar or the former Burma. So is there any connection between this settlement of uh, those particular community who came from Burma? Is there any relation between that episode of that history and the present turmoil? Um, 
absolutely that is one of them and i'll come to that but i think there are many other sort of reasons for this sort of impact that we see today that it has on society even the idea of scheduled areas that the british brought in you know uh, eventually led to unequal development between the hills and the plains and i think uh, that is something that we are seeing today take a more political role of course all these divisions uh, at that time were administrative but they were also brought in to contain populations that they couldn't tame today we may feel that they are there for our protection but that wasn't really what it was intention for and of course you know the uh, idea of bringing in populations because you see when uh, the british came into the region they weren't really welcomed you know of course uh, you know sometimes they were brought in to you know uh, have a particular position in terms of uh, uh, aiding the maharajas in defense but uh, they weren't welcomed by the local tribes and therefore they had to bring in these uh, populations very um you know very haphazardly to use them as buffer against uh, other raiding tribes but uh, their positioning and uh, later on their evolution as uh, tribes that you know are inheritors of the land that they belong to uh, obviously caused problems and it didn't just cause problems here it caused problems across the country we've seen it cause problems in uh, other parts of the region as well you have uh, specialized in ethnic studies and tribal studies so uh, what is your stand on how do you feel when the mighty is demanded st do you think that they deserve to be uh, enlisted in the scheduled list of tribes in india so my specialization actually is anthropology of religion and theology but they have some very interesting strains these subjects uh, which have uh, studies that are around tribal studies but my understanding of the northeast is particularly based on my field work uh, in the region for many years and um, from my understanding of the entire situation uh, because i trace it back to like i said colonial history and the policies that they had uh, the methods of administration uh, the lens that they used to view a lot of these populations which were anthropological lens and i've spoken about it many times uh, anthropology was a colonial arm it really didn't have an insider lens it had an outsider lens unfortunately we still use uh, anthropology to study ourselves which is a different matter altogether but uh, you know these were the reasons that you know we are asking ourselves questions like whether the uh, scheduled uh, tribe status demand of the maitis is uh, relevant or not actually that shouldn't be a question because uh, uh, they've always been considered tribes they were considered tribes or forest dwellers or uh, owners of the forest uh, in many uh, the British records. British call it the native tribes Correct. if I'm not wrong yes uh, but uh, you know that also changed they changed the nomenclature multiple times but it was always tribes hill tribes native tribes original tribes the largest tribes Uh, so if you read literature that has always been uh, uh, how they've been recorded i'm not saying one should go by uh, the absolute records of the british if you were to go beyond that also uh, there is a formidable history uh, so absolutely in my mind there is i've said this from day one there's absolutely no reason why um, the maiti should not uh, demand for scheduled tribe status on the contrary i think uh, you know the privilege that is given to the hill tribes should have been extended to the maitis long time ago of course now the excuse is uh, why didn't uh, uh, post independence uh, the maitis demand for this you know but i don't think at that time there was that kind of political awareness for the maitis to understand the repercussions or you know the impact that uh, the scheduled tribe listing would bring to them um the same would go for then many other tribes that have been included in the recent past you know so i don't think that's a fair question to ask the maiti community in the recent past we've had um during indira gandhi's tenure we've had the lambadas who've asked for scheduled tribe status they're not even tribes in terms of of course they have their own uh, uh they have their own history and uh, they have their own unique culture but uh, uh, they are nomadic tribes nomadic tribes are not similar to uh, 
you know the kind of tribes you're talking about scheduled tribe listing scheduled tribe listing also has characteristics that is attached to it characteristics such as which was uh, clarified with the local committee report which basically says that you know there is a certain amount of uniqueness of culture there is geographical uh, isolation there is a certain amount of remoteness um, the lambadas did not uh, fit into any of those categories yet they were included of course you know there also is a case that uh, therefore is uh, ensuing because of an objection for the inclusion but even till last year the hatties were included in the scheduled tribe uh, list so if tribes are still being included who have possibly less uh, matching characteristics uh, than the maitis then i think um, by that logic the maitis today have a dem uh, have a reason to demand for scheduled tribe status but aside all of that you know i don't think we should have to compare whether other tribes are getting scheduled tribe status or not i think solely on the fact that you know the maitis were uh, in my opinion the original settlers of this land you know they have an absolutely right to the same resources to the same benefits and to a level playing field and if that level playing field is scheduled tribe status then i don't think that should be an issue suspension of operation signed between the government of india and the cookie militants have been the bone of contention to yeah. for maitri is part of development so what is your take on this so of course you know uh, i think uh, there have been many points many bones of contentions in this conflict and uh, the su agreement is only one of them you know uh, obviously as we know that it was a difficult one i think it took over 8 years for an agreement to come even you know and uh, post that also we've seen even during this conflict that there has been multiple multiple amounts of uh, violations in the agreement i think those violations of course need to be assessed um investigated and if there are violations then we need to rethink the su agreement because clearly it isn't working you know when you have an agreement like this there are certain levels of um uh certain levels of uh, uh agreements in terms of the promises that you make and if that agreement is violated then either it has to be renegotiated or we have to rethink and have a creative way of addressing you know how we can reengage with the militants but all in all i don't think the su agreement um has been a very successful one and i think that has come to the fore during this conflict You were one of the uh, panel editors in the book uh, Rashtri Bhagachandra and the Bhakti Movement in Eastern Indian Literature. Uh, you have mentioned in detail uh, how revi- uh, what changes Maharaj Bhagachandra has brought uh, to the Hindu uh, believers or the Hindu uh, Hindu population here in uh, Manipur. And many scholars are of the view that these changes which maharaj bhagyachandra brought to the hindu cult here were more of a political political repercussions and less of a, something like a, a, a less of a, say as you have mentioned bhakti uh, movement uh, the changes which were brought in the cultural and religious the religious sphere were uh, because of his larger political motive so how do you react to this so uh, of course people can have different points of views and uh, if there's a larger political motive that people think that there is fair enough you know but this book particularly concentrated on um the impact that he had through religion and culture on manipur and what was interesting about it what interested me about his life and his contribution to manipur was the fact that everywhere else we've seen other religions come into the northeast as well it's never been easy you know it's always been met with resistance and there's been some amount of clash um the uniqueness of our rajshri bhagya chandra is the fact that the merger of this culture with already a very rich culture that existed here 
was seamless and to me that is the sign of two great cultures coming together and creating a hybrid culture and that really is an example to a lot of proselytizing faiths you know uh, where we have seen that there has been a certain amount of aggression a certain amount of deviation a certain amount of <coughs> a certain amount of uh, coercive influence and tactics that are used and you know with this the kind of culture that developed was uh, I think uh, one of the greatest examples of uh, cultural and religious harmony in the country and one of the reasons I decided to be involved with it is because I think that example should be really uh, brought forth uh, not just uh, you know through books like this or edited volumes but I actually think uh, stories like this should be a part of our national syllabus. Uh, what is your take on recent controversy regarding the uh, Editors Guild of India report? Uh, my opinions have been very clear about the recent uh, uh, report that they took out. I think it's a, uh, for the lack of better words, uh, that report is rubbish. You know, it is propaganda peddled in the name of journalism. Um, I've gone through that report very closely and I think anybody who looks at it with neutral eyes would realize that it was a premeditated effort to come here and uh, paint a picture that was painted in favor of one community over the other. But I also think it was highly irresponsible uh, to demonize one community, especially when you're at a stage when uh, people are talking about how to bring about peace and how to maybe uh, let go of what has happened in the last two months, which has obviously had a prolonged, you know, is going to have a prolonged emotional impact on uh, not just Manipur, but, uh, you know, a larger population that is outside of the country that has been observing it and has, is as pained by it as, uh, you know, the people of Manipur. Um, the report is also reflective of uh, the idea that um, you know journalism uh, can um, give an opinion without really doing uh, research. I don't think uh, the three people who came here, uh, I'm not sure I haven't checked their backgrounds as yet, but I don't know what sort of understanding they have about Manipur. If the entire report and the opinions that are reflected in the report, which is really something that a good journalistic report should not really include. But if that is uh, based on three days of travel in uh, Manipur, I think that really shows the arrogance of the Editor's Guild. And I think um, um, Manipur and the individuals who filed the FIR were there within their rights to do so. And I think uh, if we talk about freedom of expression, and freedom of speech, then that goes both ways. Hey, yesterday in Manipur University, uh, you talk about discrimination uh, regarding the land holdings to what, uh, as far as the Maiti is concerned. Can you reiterate uh, to our audience today so that uh, we can, uh, the audience can hear the same thing what you said yesterday? So, uh, uh, I had a limited point you know, again, uh, which was uh, around the fact that eventually these are legacy issues, it's a historical issue and it's related to uh, land distribution primarily. Of course, you know, we've seen it through the lens of infiltration, we've seen it through the lens of uh, uh, many other issues uh, like uh, uh, anxieties around demographic change. Uh, but I do think primarily if the land issues were to be addressed, and uh, were to be addressed in a way that uh, is respected by both the communities. And I think for that also, both the communities need to understand that they have to cede some space, but also that they have to understand that these are genu genuine anxieties, these are genuine problems. You know, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, um, a lot of people realize that Imphal is already uh, sort of bursting at its seams and in another 20 or 30 years, uh, the possibility is that if it isn't opened up, uh, it would possibly become fairly unlivable. Um, so looking at the practical reasons and looking at also the fairness of it, I think it is important to uh, reiterate the fact that 
all these other problems that we have, whether it's infiltration, whether it's anxieties or demographic change, would be addressed if the land issue was addressed. And I think uh, uh, that was my limited point in uh, my talk. But I think uh, there are also many ways of doing that. You know, of course, inclusion in the scheduled tribe list is a way. And I've always been a great proponent of the fact that you know, that is something that the Maiti should demand for and continue the demand for. Uh, it is a long process, you know, but uh, these processes would result in a fruitful outcome, in my opinion. But I think there could be also a relook on our land laws, and uh, that could prove uh, beneficial as well. But of course, that is something that uh, experts on the land laws on Manipur would have a better commentary on. But I think that is something the central government should be focusing on. Uh, recently, uh, Ms. Desai, a UN report published by DW.com on 25th May 2023, written by Murali Krishnan, stated, and I quote, since the military junta seized power in Myanmar in February 2021, companies within India, including state-owned entities, have shipped at least $51 million worth of arms, raw materials and associate supplies to Myanmar's military and arm dealers. Here in India, government have signed suspension of operation with those militant groups who are fighting the junta. So will this affect the long-term relation between NAPITO and Delhi. What, what do you think about it? So the relation with NAPITO and Delhi today is a good relationship. You know, and I think this is very important to keep a good relationship with our neighbours. We also have the neighbourhood first policy, you know, which, um, uh, which is a part of our larger policy, which aims at keeping our neighbourhoods uh, close to us. I don't think um, there is any reason to alienate Myanmar. And, Myanmar has been alienated by many, many countries. The US has put uh, sanctions uh, on Myanmar, the Burma 2020 sanctions. Even the use of the word Burma is provocated because, as you know, that the junta prefers to call itself Myanmar. But having said that, uh, they've also put sanctions on two of the uh, military, uh, uh, the military bodies that manufacture uh, and sell arms and ammunition. Uh, I think that is a dangerous game to play. Um, maybe US does not understand um, the politics of uh, regions like this because uh, I feel, and this is absolutely my personal opinion, that you know, if um, if uh, these sort of sanctions are put and Myanmar is alienated, China already has a great footprint in Myanmar. Uh, China already owns assets lands, we know the deal with the Cocoa Islands, we know their uh, oil and gas pipelines, uh, we know uh, their revisionist attitude and we also know the implications that it has not just on India but on the larger Indo-Pacific. So if that is the case and if Myanmar is so critical and so important not just to India as its gateway to Southeast Asia but also important to be able to, um, you know, create um, some sort of uh, stability for India. Uh, even in this conflict, we noticed that because of the relationships between uh, Tatmadaw and uh, India, we saw that uh, the notification that they took out just at the outset of the conflict, very clearly warning its uh, citizens that live in India uh, to not uh, create any communal tensions, to not indulge in uh, farming of any illegal uh, commodities, which they were obviously indicating at poppy cultivation, was a very big thing for a country to admit. And, you know, that sort of honesty and that sort of uh, support can only come when you have good relations with these countries. So I think whatever steps uh, India takes towards uh, Myanmar, positive steps should be seen in positive light and uh, seen as a balancing act towards uh, China's influence in Myanmar. 
how do you feel i mean uh, uh, these uh, turmoil or civil unrest has been going for the last four odd months and uh, schools and colleges are affected kids are affected there are many uh, displaced people who have resided in the relief camp and many uh, families have been ruined and many kids have become orphan and so in such a turmoil uh, the way forward is peace and only peace can bring solution to this uh, conflict but it seems that uh, with these four months of turmoil the peace is a distant dream now so in your view what do you think that uh, can be done from the state government or central government so that a peace can be brought in at uh, very quickly or in a, a very short span of time see i don't think we should be we we should lose hope you know things have improved to a great extent from what we saw in may or what we saw uh, you know in june uh, so i do feel that you know that some sort of normalcy is coming back and of course you know it still is artificial normalcy you know we know that we are still living on the edge and any trigger could uh, set off you know another round of uh, skirmishes between the communities but um, I think yes you're right I think that peace is not going to be uh, we are not going to have peace very quickly it's going to take time the reason it's going to take time is because of the trust deficit and the very deep fault lines that have been formed now I don't think it's uh, not possible to overcome them we've seen many conflicts happen throughout the country uh, between communities that have uh, historically lived together um, and continue to do so uh, so i think uh, it's very possible for uh, us to have some level of peace and understanding between these communities but yes that will take time and that will come with some amount of trust building exercises but uh, the question about what the state government should do and what the central government should do are two very wide questions because there's a lot to be done i think first of all it's hugely hugely important to disarm civilians uh, disarm militants for as much as it's possible i know it's easier said than done you know and i know that uh, the home minister when he first came had appealed um, to the people to surrender arms and arms had been surrendered as well you know maybe not all of them but we'd seen to the amount of 2000 2500 weapons that had been stolen come back uh yet that is not enough i think a determined effort has to be made the state has to be you know has to take an active role in disarming you know uh, civilians i think uh, this sort of weapons that are you know that are floating around in uh, the society are obviously going to be used by miscreants they're not going to be used by people like you and me you know so that is a very dangerous situation that we've put ourselves in so i think one of the first things would be that i think the second thing would be to really be clear about the fact that there is a land distribution issue and that has to be addressed now to address that obviously is not going to be easy because we know just with the mere recommendation of a high court order uh, there was such a extreme reaction um i think uh, really um these processes have to be explained to people maybe the central government or maybe the high court thought maybe the state government thought that uh, people already knew what the processes are because you cannot get tribal uh, uh, status just by a mere recommendation of the high court it will go to the state the state will recommend it further on it will go to tri it will go to ncsd there will be many bodies that will sit to look at how uh, viable it is and then Uh, a decision will be taken w- based on these reports whether a uh, status should be given or not so maybe with uh, some sort of education and uh, some sort of uh, uh, dissemination of knowledge of what these processes are before a decision on any sort of reforms on land laws or uh, the inclusion in scheduled tribe list should also be thought about of course this is not the time to do it 
you know i think uh, time would be very crucial it's not going to happen anytime soon and it shouldn't happen anytime soon because tempers are still flaring i don't think anybody yet unfortunately a couple of months ago i thought that in a couple of months people would be in a mood to be able to analyze and you know rationalize uh, the, the demands of one community and the demands of another uh, but it seems like it's not happened tempers have not calmed down so obviously this is not the time to do that nobody is going to be in a reciprocative mood uh, but in time i think logic and rationality will prevail with the help of uh, government intervention but uh, beyond that also i think there is now a lot of work not just with the central government but also with the state governments because uh, we are going to have a lot of rehabilitation on our hands i think uh, again uh, having like you said you know we've seen this very very sad situation take place where thousands of people have been displaced and you know there's been absolute disrus uh, disruption of lives and uh, that has impacted the vulnerable groups uh, i'm not even going into the psychological impacts on women and children and men who've seen the horrors of this conflict but i am merely talking about the uh, impact of displacement and having to leave your homes where you have historically you know been uh, you know uh, that's been the area that you know historically has belonged to you you felt has belonged to you you know that kind of displacement is has great impacts not just uh, you know not just the way we look at it but also in society in general that sort of rehabilitation is very important i think we have to ensure that you know with all the other support that these people are given that there is a time and maybe that time is not today but there is a time that they can go back to where they came from we've seen complete villages being erased and i think that is very sad but unless you know those uh, situations are contained and um, unless there the optics are right wherein we can see these communities have homes back in those places where they can go back safely and this is not just you know something that the state government the central government is going to do or going to be effectively able to do i think this is what communities will have to do as well you know because eventually if they if you're going to have if you're going to have uh, mixed populations live as we do anywhere in the world anywhere in this country then you know you have to feel comfortable with each other so i think um, uh, communities have that responsibility to welcome and ensure the safety of these displaced persons um, we also i think have to address the concerns of development in the hill areas as well if that is the major concern then that is you know what we need to address uh, i don't think there is absolutely any reason the only reason that there is a uh, you know now today there is we see a more determined demand for a separate administration or uh, some sort of uh, uh, separate uh, uh, a deep and separate identity i think that um, will really the really will not hold any weight if the actual issues are addressed in terms of uh, what uh, they want uh what is the development uh, in initiatives that they want the state government to take the central governments to take and i think that will come through dialogue and uh, really a determined approach and understanding of what the loopholes are clearly there is leakage of funding uh, finances that are going into the hills uh, clearly uh, there have been and i've spoken to many community members who've said there's also a question of the amount of finances that come into these areas so all of this needs to be analyzed by experts and uh, solutions uh, workable solutions need to come through this and i already do understand that uh, committees have been put forward informal and formal committees to look into these areas and i think maybe expediting processes like that would be very helpful also being able to involve uh, senior leaders of these communities trusted leaders uh, people who have a rational voice and are accepted by the larger community involving them in these processes would be very important but also involving 
other smaller communities. Uh, I think at this point, you know, the country is looking at it as, you know, only three communities in Manipur, you know, but there are so many other smaller communities with identities of their own who don't have a voice because they're really just, you know, by population so tiny. I think involving them also would really send a good message out of inclusive development and inclusive initiatives. If we see uh, the India's Lugis policy, the importance of More is always highlighted. And since 1992, it seems that various community are uh, at a race to hold or dominate these particular town called More. So what do you think is there any relevance with this present conflict and the dominance of More and this uh, Lugis policy? Is there any relevance on all this? Is there any dots you can uh, pull over? See, I think Moray is a hugely, hugely important city and I think that hasn't been lost on anybody because that really is the gateway to Southeast Asia. Um, you know, there is no other way that we can fulfill our uh, Actis policy and what we want to achieve with the Actis policy without Moray being our gateway and without uh, Moray being a stable uh, geographical area. I think the problem is that uh, we've seen conflicts happen in Moray before as well. And for what was considered a very vibrant and multicultural and, you know, multi-community uh, town today, unfortunately, does not fulfill uh, that vision that we had of Moray. Um, we've seen uh, the cleansing of uh, the Naga community from there as well and there are obviously there are still some other smaller communities that are still living there and I hope and pray that they continue living there but I don't think that really is quite enough. I think uh, because Moray is so important and other areas as well um, that have similar characteristics to Moray are so important you know these are areas that really should form the basis of our um, uh, of our economic uh, uh, initiatives, you know. So I think it's very important to realize what Moray can do for us. But Moray being a gateway really is dependent on how multicultural Moray is. It's really dependent on how stable Moray is. And I think uh, we've sort of lost that perspective at this point. So maybe, in the, you know, this is a, uh, this is a point that uh, I've had an opportunity to discuss with some experts as well. Um, maybe creating some sort of special economic zones out of these areas would give incentive to other communities to come back and settle here, to have industry uh, take root here once again. And I think that would really be uh, really important in stabilizing More, making it a really um, making it a really stable city, so that again that can become a viable point of access to Southeast Asia, which, you know, of course, is going to benefit not just the Northeast and the rest of the country, but primarily it is going to benefit Manipur and any, uh, anybody who understands that and understands the benefits that it is going to bring to the state would have no objection to it. With this, uh, we have come to the end of this interview. We thank Rami Nirandan Desai for a valuable time. Thank you, Ms. Desai. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me on. In fun times ki interview a student, yek biri bhi singna subscribe to mera mu. Amadi, hai bhi ningba. Hindu hani ningba leer gasu. Bahari kamienda. Mai khara dil mera mu. I know, but it's...